Emily Guy Birkin is a former educator, lifelong money nerd, and a Plutus award-winning freelance writer specializing in the scientific research behind irrational money behaviors. Her background in education is her magic as she has the ability to make complex financial topics relatable and easily understood by everyday people like you and me. And if that isn't impressive enough, she's also the author of several books, including The Five Years Before You Retire, End Financial Stress Now, and co-author of a brand new book, Stacked, Your Super Serious Guide to Modern Money Management. Emily lives in Milwaukee with her husband, two sons, a cat, and a retired greyhound. There's got to be a story there. (laughs) So welcome, Emily. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Well, one of the things in the bio that we didn't talk about was what you like to do for fun when you're not researching mm. and writing about money. So what, what do you do for fun in Milwaukee? So, um, well, I love to draw. Um, I, I used to draw a lot when I was a kid, and then I took a 25-year break. And then when I was about 35, um, I, for some reason, I got the bug and started uh, just doing little drawings every day when I would do my to-do list for the next day. And that has kind of grown and grown and grown to where... Um, uh, my co-author invited me to include a couple of illustrations in our new book, Stacked, which uh, was very exciting and a little overwhelming. Uh, so that's one thing I love to do. I'm also an avid reader. Um, you'll always find me either with a book in my hand or a new audio book going on my, my phone. Um, and I really like um, uh, being outside, playing games and, and riding bikes with my kids. Um, they're, they're little for such a short time. So I try to enjoy yes. that as much as possible. Yeah, that's great. Well, and that drawing, that's a perfect illustration of how just a little bit and practice mm-hmm. is really makes the biggest impact, you know, so I love that, that you developed it in those tiny, enjoyable chunks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, um, what your blog and your books are about and who you serve through them. So my blog and my books are about um, helping people understand that a lot of the stress and pressure we feel about money is unnecessary. That's not to say that there's no no such thing as financial stress. Of course there is. But a lot of it we hold on to because of our own beliefs, um, our own uh, thought patterns, our own financial trauma, um, emotions, morality, all of these things. And we can let go of that and feel better and make better decisions. Mm -hmm. so while I, I write my books very much for everyone, my blog is, uh, is, uh, generally tends to resonate with women, okay. um, at, which is because I'm coming from my point of view as, mm-hmm. as a, a, a mom, a 40-something woman um, who's had multiple careers. And you know, I feel like there's a lot that I can um, reach other women like me. Yeah. Well, what got you interested in finances? You know, like, is it something you just have always enjoyed? Or Mm -hmm. was there like a financial crisis that was a wake up call? What was it? So uh, I like to tell people that I I tripped and fell backwards into this career. (laughs) Uh, So I have always been a money nerd. I never really thought of it that way. Um, For a long time, it was one of those where like, I knew that I was interested in it in a way that like my sister, for instance, wasn't. Um, Our dad uh, was a financial planner. And so even as a a small child, I can remember like hanging on his every word as he's talking about tax refunds, Right. (laughs) (laughs) whereas my sister was not. Uh, And so and so these are things that I just I spent a lot of time thinking about. I would read about it. I just found that found things really, really interesting. Then um, in 2010, my husband and I moved for was Ohio. We moved to Lafayette, Indiana, um, because he got a new job. Uh, I had been teaching high school English up until that point, um, and we were also expecting our first child. And because mm-hmm. we're just fantastic at timing, our first child was due at the beginning of the following school year. So, which meant I knew I wasn't getting a, a teaching job just to yeah. immediately go on maternity leave. So, um, and then for further uh, proof, we're great at timing. We also put our house on the market in Columbus right after the end of the um, uh, first time home buyers um, credit, tax credit expired. <laughs> so it took us nearly a year to sell that house. Uh-huh. So uh, because we went from two people in the family to three, 
um, two incomes to one and one mortgage to two, I wanted yeah. to find some ways to be keeping a little bit more. That's money not the money. math you want to do. Not <laughs> ideal. <laughs> um, and so I, I started looking for um, some freelancing work that I could do um, as, a, as a writer because um, I was an English teacher. I majored in, high, in, in English in, uh, in college, uh, and I've always been a writer. Uh, and one of the first jobs that I landed was for a financial website. Um, it hadn't occurred to me that I knew enough about money to write about it. Um, mm. But the financial website was willing to give me a chance. And I thought it was really interesting, the type of stuff that I'd be writing about. Uh, and a, because I came at it from a different perspective than a lot of the finance people who become freelance writers in this sphere, um, I was able, I think, to reach his audience in a different way than he, than he was expecting. Uh, one of my early pieces for him went viral, or as as viral as as financial articles. Right, so right, so yeah. Like tens <laughs> of people read it. <laughs> yes, yes. But it went, it did well, and so he passed my name along to uh, his friends, and he invited me to a conference that he was putting together um, for people in the financial media sphere. Um, and so from there, I got more clients, and it just kind of kept snowballing from there. Uh, and I, at that point, uh, as much as I missed teaching, I did not miss. Um, being a teacher. Uh, and um, because we were, we had moved to this new place with, um, you know, without knowing anyone there, uh, it was going to make a lot more sense for me to have a uh, career that I could work from home um, yeah. than to, to work to get back to the classroom. And so, and this, this, uh, you know, bonus unexpected career fit me like a glove. So mm. um, that was 12 years ago. <laughs> and that's, that's fabulous. Yeah. So that, that explains your shift from teaching. Um, but how did you, so you started with writing. How did you shift then from just writing for other people to starting your own blog and mm -hmm. doing coaching calls? So um, for a long time, I said I, I preferred to be a blogger for hire um, mm -hmm. because I, there were aspects of blogging that I wasn't interested in. Um, right. And I'm still not. Yeah. <laughs> um, finding finding a way to to make your blog pay mm -hmm. is not something that I, I particularly like doing. That's that's not why I got into it. Um, and so, but what happened was um, after I'd been doing it for several years, I realized there were things that I wanted to say that I couldn't say for my um, for my uh, paid clients. Right. And so it made sense to to you know really start branding myself. Um, and, you know, put out the things that I really cared about and, and uh, have my own blog that way. And then as an extension of that, I have had people tell me for a long time, like, why don't you become a financial planner? I think you'd be great at it. And um, I have thought about it and I'm not really interested. It's the same sort of thing. I'm not really interested in the specifics of being a financial planner. Right. Um, what interests me is helping people shift their mindset about money. Mm. And that's not exactly what a financial planner does. No. And so um, I was actually on my 40th birthday, I, uh, I had a ridiculous uh, rainbow and unicorn themed birthday party <laughs> <laughs> for my 40th birthday. Uh, and there were some tasty beverages there and I'd had a few. And I, I told my friends at this party, like, I, I really would like to do this. About a week later, one of my friends who was there called me and she says, were you serious about that? I was like, well, I, I think so. But, you know, I've had a few beverages. <laughs> and she's like, well, because I'd like to hire you. Mm. And so um, so that got me started there. Um, I, I'm very grateful to my friend Jo because she um, took me seriously. Mm -hmm. And she was my first client. Um, and uh, she insisted the other thing I said, OK, well, if you're if you're serious about this, I, I don't, I, since I'm practicing with yeah. you, like, let's, let's just do this as a trade. She's like, no, 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 I want to pay you. Like, you can charge me less than you're planning to. <laughs> right. Yeah. She yeah. insisted on, on paying me. Well, let's make time. it real. Yeah. 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 And, um, and it's kind of gone from there where um, it's my first few clients were all people I, I knew personally. Mm -hmm. But um, at this point, I, I am fielding clients from all over the country. Um, and what I really like about, um, how I set up the way that I do coaching is unlike uh, a lot of times when you think coaching, you think um, you pay for six months mm -hmm. um, for, you know, and you meet, you know, twice a month or something and you get homework in between. And that, that's how coaching is. I didn't want to do 
um, my coaching that way. What I do is someone will call me generally with uh, like a specific issue. Mm -hmm. Um, For instance, someone's trying to decide what to do with uh, their student loans. Do they, do they refinance with a private lender or what does it make more sense to, to keep it with a federal um, and what are going to be the options if they do one or the other, Mm -hmm. or someone will be trying to decide is declaring bankruptcy the right thing to do or is there a way forward considering the, the financial issues? And so what I do um, often, uh, the coaching is only about two or three hours worth of, of work. I usually do about an hour phone call where we you know, establish the situation, what's going on. And then I'll do research and a write-up with, um, not a, they're not recommendations because uh, I'm not in a position to be able to make right. recommendations, but to say, here are your options. So yeah. with the student These are loans, just factual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, if you want to stay with the, with the um, federal loans, these are your options for repayment. This is the p- probability of forgiveness. This is what you can expect with the COVID pause. Um, and this is how much you'll end up paying in interest over time. And mm-hmm. this is if you um, switch to a refinance and so on and so forth. And so what I'm doing is something that the people generally, you can do that yourself. This information is available. It's right. just people get paralyzed. Um, and the idea of trying to make a decision can seem overwhelming. And so to receive a, a spreadsheet from me that has it all laid out in black and white with, you know, this is, uh, these are your options. This is the one that's going to cost the least. This is the one that's going to take the least amount of time. Um, mm-hmm. This is the one that, uh, <laughs> that is going to um, have the best chance of um, getting some amount forgiven, you know, all of those mm-hmm. different uh, options. And then from there, you can make your decision rather yeah. than feeling like you have to do the research and then make the decision, which can make anyone feel paralyzed and, and want to stop dealing it with it at all. Right. Because there, it's not apples to apples all the time. And sometimes, exactly. you know, freeing up cash flow is more important than keeping it a short term, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, mm-hmm. and when you are only looking at one sliver, it's really hard to compare because- yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's excellent. Well, as moms and mompreneurs, um, it can often, it can easily feel like when we say yes to something business related, we're saying no as parents. Mm-hmm. So when it came to integrating your home and family with your business, um, what were your main priorities, um, the places that you really wanted to focus your energy, mm-hmm. and what were the struggles that um, you faced trying to keep those things top of mind as a top of mind. <laughs> there we go. As an, as a mompreneur. Uh, for me, the, the hard part was recognizing that having the kids when they're very little, when they were very little, mm-hmm. having the kids in daycare meant that I was present when they were at home. Mm. Um, and that was, that was something I had to do some trial and error to learn and figure out. Um, cause early on, um, I started freelancing in November, 2010. My eldest was born August 31st of that year. Okay. So he was still very mm-hmm. tiny, too small to go to daycare or anything like that. And he was still in the, you know, nap for two hours mm-hmm. and that worked great. Um, and then it stopped working, you know, yeah. once he got to be a little bit older and, uh, recognizing like that, um, investing in having him in daycare, both the financially and the emotionally, um, was so much better for him and for me and for our family as a whole than trying to make it work with him at home with me. And so, so that's what I've been trying to, to do throughout. And, you know, it's, it's, as I said, trial and error, it's not Mm -hmm. always right, but recognizing when I am with my kids, I'm with them. Yeah. And when I'm working, I'm working. And so that way, I don't feel that, um, that pressure to be doing both at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was particularly tough during the lockdown for the early lockdown days of the pandemic. That's um, right. But uh, it, it's something that has been, um, I feel like has been really helpful. For one yeah. thing, the kids respect that I am, am a working parents. Um, not that uh, uh, stay-at-home moms aren't working parents. They definitely are. Right. Um, but they understand that there are some times where it's like, okay, mom has her office door closed. So now it's not a good time. Um, but I try, I, I try to do as much as I can to um, keep my work time um, confined to when they're at school or mm-hmm. at camp. Uh, so that they they know that I'm there with them when it's when it's uh, family time and uh, I'm I'm in my office when it's work time. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's excellent. We we often approach things one school year or one semester at a mm-hmm. time. What is it going to look like this semester? Because needs change. But mm-hmm. I think that's really, um, that's freeing. That's great permission for people to say, this is a clear way to put a boundary in place without sacrificing either side of the equation. Mm-hmm. So yeah. um, I think that was really, really smart because we are afraid as moms. I think a lot of times when we're stay-at-home moms building a business to say, I'm going to put my kids in daycare, we think that's reserved for moms who work outside of the home. And that's mm-hmm. actually a really good to a member of our mom team, you know? <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. It's, I, I, I feel like not only was it, um, was it good for me in terms of um, protecting my time, um, it also was good because it made sure that I, I didn't dilly dally, mm. you know, it, mm-hmm. it's, it's very easy to get stuck on Facebook or, you know, yes, or, yes. Or, or, but when you've got two hours, <laughs> you've got two hours and then the baby comes home, yeah. you've got to get your work done. Um, and then I think it was also, uh, my, my eldest did not want to be in daycare for, for a while. And so like, I had that, like, you know, turn the night moment yeah. every day where I'm dropping him off and he's, he's upset. And then one day there was a day where um, they had one of those little, um, uh, what do you call those? Those little like wagons that have like space for six babies. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. And he loved going in the, that. And so I, when I dropped him off, they were about to take a walk with that. And so like they, they strapped him in and he's giving, he's going. Oh, <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. I, was, I it was just, it, it made me my, my heart itch. And it also uh, made me feel like, you know what, this is actually good for him too, because mm-hmm. he's learning that there's, there's other safe places and fun places to be and that mom will always come back. And that yeah. this is, this is a good lesson for him, even as a tiny baby to, 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 to be figuring out and learning how to, how to mm-hmm. be with friends. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's a gift. That's great. Um, so we live, we live in this instant gratification world. I see this with my kids with everything for sure, you know, and I have to say that like Amazon has not helped this at <laughs> all, <laughs> but even ads on Instagram and Facebook, you know, they, they offer these astounding results. And so it seems like um, we as a, as a society are now in general, just focusing on the end result happening now and not the process to get there. So I love your drawing Mm -hmm. illustration, no pun intended, because, you know, (laughs) it took you a little bit of time to get there. It wasn't overnight that you drew in your book. Mm -hmm. So how, how does this relate to, um, you know, how we behave when it comes to money, this, you know, everything's easily attainable. Um, but especially when it comes to saving and investing Mm -hmm. and investing, because a lot of people really think you have to have a chunk of money before Mm -hmm. you can invest. So how does that all relate when you talk with people? Uh, that's one of the hardest things to learn because that, that, um, that instant gratification is, we all feel it. Um, and what I tell people is to, um, find a way to enjoy the journey. Mm. So um, a good example of this is, um, uh, and is a little easier for me to explain is with writing. Mm. So as I said, I've always been a writer. Um, From the time I was very, very small, I knew I wanted to write books. And uh, the thing is, there is this sense that like, once you have a book published, um, you wake up that morning, your skin is clear. Right. <laughs> all, of your, all of your exes are jealous of you. That's right. <laughs> you yes. Die apart, the sun shines. And you have no more worries. There's no more, <laughs> all of your problems are fixed. That's right. And no, that is not true. <laughs> um, and so not only does, uh, does publishing a book not solve all your problems, it does not make you rich. <laughs> Um, yeah, that's not a reason to write. It creates books. new problems. <laughs> uh, yes, um, it is. It is simply um, one stage on the journey of being a writer. Yeah, and so for me, it's easier to recognize. Like, well, why am I doing this writing? Well, because I love it. Because I feel compelled to do it. Because on every single day when I show up at the page, I want to put my words down, and so. Yes, I want to write a book that is, you know, a, a runaway bestseller and Oprah has me come to her house and tells me she loves it. And I'm yes. like, I will not say no if that ever happens. Right. <laughs> but every single day I get joy out of putting words on paper. Yeah. So when it comes to money, that's a lot, a little harder because very few of us are like, yay, I'm spending $10 to my, 
my 401k. Right. It, it's, it doesn't have that same sort of joy that you feel from like drawing or writing mm-hmm. or, you know, something creative. But if you can find a way to enjoy the journey, find a way to um, uh, make those little moments something that you celebrate, then that is going to have this huge effect down the line. Because for one thing, you are doing these little moments and you can just do the, um, you know, like even get a, 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 a sound effect on your phone for what, like anytime you, you move money into your 401k or anytime yeah. you decide not to buy something that you are thinking about, you have a little, your phone go, yes, <laughs> something happy, not like a whoosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, my, one of my favorite things, my sister has uh, an Amazon Echo. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so, and she calls it a computer and she'll say, Hey computer, how am I doing? And, and it goes, Tracy, you are crushing it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so I think I think uh, you know if you've got like an Echo or one of those or Siri, you could uh, um, when you move money aside or you uh, decide not to buy something, you could program it so when you say, "I didn't buy something I wanted," and Siri will be like, "You are crushing." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so find those little things, those little yeah. victories, and you'll you'll look forward to having more of those little victories. And then uh, an amazing thing happens is as you have the little victories you know, six months, a year, four years down the line, you'll be like, holy cow, look how much better I'm doing. Look at what my 401k is. Look how my investments are growing. Um, look how, how my uh, credit card debt has gone down. Uh, and so that's really what it comes down to is instead of focusing on the big end result, find something, a little something that you can do on a daily or weekly basis that you're going to like and look forward to doing and make part of your, your general uh, process. Okay. That's great advice now. And that's, that's good advice because everyone can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, But everyone Mm -hmm. does have a different situation. We have different income, different cost of living, different family sizes, different challenges. And I know from experience that a lot of the finance books tend to be a one size fits all and they don't take into account things, especially like, irregular self-employed income Mm -hmm. (laughs) or Mm -hmm. sizable medical debt because, you know, you had a huge deductible. So what is your approach for taking a perfect on paper plan and making it adaptable for real life when it's not, it's not all neatly lined up like that? (laughs) Yeah. Not everyone gets a a biweekly paycheck. Right. Yeah. Um, so what I want people to, to, um, think about if they have a regular income, is what's going to work best for them. So that's that's always um, um, a part of it. Rather than uh, we tend to kind of scramble behind. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we tend to be reactive. Like, oh, I you know I have a huge month this month, and so that's great. I'm going to um, pay for the plumbing that we needed, and like you know what, steak dinner for everyone, and this, that, right. and the other. And then the next month, oh, there's next to nothing. All right, I got to dip into savings just to be able to pay the mortgage. Um, and so it's really helpful to sit and think in a forward, um, uh, way like, okay, how much do I need per month just to keep the lights on, uh, and figure that out and then, um, figure out what to do about, um, when you have extra income, you know, where that's going to go so that it's not, um, completely gone by the time you get to the next month, uh, Mm -hmm. and, you know, really kind of create a situation where, in ideally, you'll be able to be paying yourself a salary. Mm-hmm. So for people with irregular income, um, what, uh, what I think is really, really helpful is having your income deposited into savings and then pay yourself a salary out of it. So that mm-hmm. can take some time to build up just yeah. because, um, you know, depending on how irregular your income is, where you are, it, it's, it's going to be tough. Um, but once you get to that point, you can just keep a keep a um, a steady eye on your savings account um, mm-hmm. and make sure that you're gonna have enough for that regular paycheck that you're giving yourself. Mm-hmm. That's that's the first aspect of it is um, when there's this perfect on paper um, setup, you can recreate that even if you have a different situation. It just takes more steps. Okay. And so recognizing that it's gonna take those more steps and sitting down and figuring out how to do that. And a lot of people will avoid that because they're like, oh, that sounds so stressful. I don't want to do that. Um, 
and that's fine. Um, mm -hmm. what, I, what I invite people who feel that way to think about is, is it actually more stressful to sit down and make those decisions? Or is it more stressful to be putting out fires when mm -hmm. the irregular income is crashing rather than rising? Right, right. And so, and for most people, like, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't like those fire putting out moments. Like, those mm -hmm. are really awful. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of being um, free of those kinds of stressors. Um, it may feel stressful to sit down and do it, but it has, it frees you up in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other aspect that I, I really want everyone to understand is there's no wrong way to money as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral. That's right. Yes. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm not advocating uh, robbing banks or anything like that. But no matter how you handle your budget, if it works, it works. And it does mm -hmm. not have to be a color coded spreadsheet. It does not have to be, you know, a, a an app on your phone. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be how your mother did it. It's, it. it's whatever works for you. So if what works for you is, uh, you know, keeping things in envelopes and you're able to keep things straight that way, go for it. Mm -hmm. If what works for you is um, doing everything on a credit card and then paying attention to where everything goes on the on your credit card statement, go for it. Mm -hmm. uh, however you operate, you know, whatever your money psychology is and whatever you, the way that you look at the world mm -hmm. uh, is going to be just fine for finding a, a budgeting system and uh, the, an operating system, basically, that works for your life. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk about allowances, because a lot of families use allowances as the vehicle to teach their kids about money. Mm -hmm. And there are a million approaches to how you could do this. Should you do it? Are you paying, you know, should they get paid for doing stuff? Or are they just mm -hmm. expected to do it? And we're going to give them money. Um, but what are your thoughts on allowances and how do you teach your kids about money? So uh, I find allowances are an excellent way to teach kids about tracking their expenses. Mm. Uh, and in fact, I have a children's ledger that, um, uh, and I can give you a link to it um, uh, for the show notes, um, where uh, kids can um, write down when they receive allowance, when they spend money, um, mm -hmm. and, and all of that. Now, here's why I think that's important. Um, a big part of financial literacy is understanding where your money goes mm -hmm. and knowing when to expect money um, and, and those sorts of things. You know, it's very difficult to plan ahead um, and it's very difficult to, um, to, you know, get ahead, you know, save money, invest if you don't know where your money's going. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, I also am a big believer in writing things down, um, you know, in, with pen and paper yeah. Uh, even though we are going more and more to a digital digital lifescape, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, but there is they have uh, proven that there is uh, you're more likely to remember something if you actually write it down. Okay. So for my kids, I um, when we started giving them an allowance, we paired it with a ledger, and when we give them an allowance, we um, we uh, ask them to write write it down, which is you know great for a bunch of things. It helps with their handwriting and spelling. Um, and, you know, understanding how to write dates um, and uh, math, you know, ask them mm -hmm. to figure out like, okay, so if you're getting $5 for allowance, how much does that, does that make? Uh, and it also empowers them because if there's a week that I forget to give them their allowance, they know. Right. They know. <laughs> it's in black and white right here. <laughs> yes, it's right there. So I think um, I personally think that allowance should not necessarily be tied to uh, to chores, although I, I have seen plenty of parents who have a different viewpoint on that. Mm -hmm. um, and there there are lots of different ways to do it. And what's right for your family is not necessarily going to be right for every family. Right. Right. Um, but I think that giving kids an allowance and letting them fail with it is really important because mm -hmm. if they fail with money when it, the stakes are small, they yeah. are prepared for when the stakes are bigger. So yes. for instance, my younger son, when he was, I think about six, and he had only just started getting an allowance. Um, so that's, that's how the kids were when we started, was at age six. Uh, and he decided he wanted a new Batman toy. Mm. Uh, he's always loved Batman since he was tiny. And so he found this toy, and it was going to use up pretty much every penny in his piggy bank. Mm. And so he found this toy, and he's like, yes, yes, I want it. And I said, okay, all right, we'll, we'll order it. And then, like, uh, as soon as we hit 
buy and he paid the paid because we were ordering it online. He gave mm-hmm. the cash to, to to reimburse mom and dad. Like his little, his little <laughs> lower lip started quivering. He was like, oh, but it, but the money's gone. And we're like, yeah. yes, and and it it was so hard not to say it's okay, honey. I'll pay for it. It was mm-hmm. so hard not to say that because I. I, like it was such a little thing in in the scheme of adult life, um, and and he was so sad, and he was going back and forth. Well, maybe maybe I, I said, if do you want to return it and keep the money? He's like, but I want the Batman. Mm. <laughs> and back and forth, yeah. and my husband and I like stayed strong. We're like, okay, honey, well, it's your choice. Just so you know, but letting him feel that loss of the money. Mm-hmm. It's something that's going to stick with him. Yeah. And instead of mom and dad swooping in and, and saving him from that uncomfortable feeling, um, he's not going to be in a position when he's 18 or 26 mm-hmm. to feel like, well, mom and dad will fix it. You know, that right. I don't have the money anymore for, for rent because, you know, I spent it on something, mm-hmm. uh, go to concert, whatever. Yeah. So, and that, that I think is very hard for us to do is mm-hmm. to let our kids fail. Um, particularly when the stakes are low because we can, we can fix it. Like mm-hmm. we want to fix it. We want them to feel happy, but it's when the stakes are low, when we can fix it, that we need them to feel those, those consequences. Yeah. And there's value to it being tactile with actual cash mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. addition to just numbers on paper, because that act of handing it over to you was probably also part of that emotion, you know, cause yeah there was a physical loss, you know, of yeah, money. He, <laughs> so he definitely felt the loss. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is probably a mom listening who is just, you know, she's feeling a little stuck. She's wondering, do I pay off? Do I pay off my debt? Do I save her for retirement? Do I do both? What, what would you tell her? What is one little thing that she could do today to start to shift her approach to money? Uh, so a lot of times we talk about like paying off debt and, uh, and saving for retirement or investing for retirement um, as like opposites, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, do one or the other. Uh, and they are not, you know, you can do both and you should do both at the same time. Uh, because depending on how much your, your uh, the debt costs you, what your interest rates are, mm-hmm. um, that money is a, a greater cost than you might be able to earn mm-hmm. in uh, the stock market with, with investing. However, on the other hand, so you might hear that and go, oh, okay, so, so send every penny to, to debt payoff. Mm-hmm. Well, no, because um, compound interest is this magical force that mm-hmm. needs time to work. So the earlier you start, the better it's going to work and the more you're going to see um, uh, incredible results from it. Mm-hmm. So doing both is really going to be the best way of handling this kind of situation. And when I talk about doing both, it's going to be different for every person. You know, if I, mm-hmm. if I say like, oh, 50, 50, that's not true for everyone. For some people, it's going to make sense to send, you know, whatever their uh, discretionary money is, send 10% to, uh, to retirement and 90% to pay off that, that debt because mm-hmm. it has really exorbitant interest rates. For some people, it's going to be the opposite um, or anything in between. It's about sitting down and figuring out um, how much you can afford overall, Mm -hmm. um, where that money is going to pack a good punch, um, both for your your future um, retirement and for getting your your debt paid off, and really kind of crunching those numbers. And then also, it somewhat uh, is based on how you feel. Uh, If you're someone who just, it hurts to know that you have a big debt, Mm -hmm. um, it is okay to um, do more prioritization of that debt than Mm -hmm. retirement, even if that the numbers don't don't make sense, as long as you do still do something for retirement. Mm -hmm. And then you can snowball the savings for retirement Mm -hmm. right off of when you've paid off that debt and just (laughs) really, you know, hit it hard then. Yeah. Well, that's good advice because you're right. We often look in terms of this hundred dollars can save me this 14% interest, but that hundred dollars invested in 20 years could be, is going to be more than that 14%. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a great conversation. And, um, and as we wrap up, this is my favorite question because I'm a gadget gal. Um, but what is your favorite time-saving gadget system or tool? Mm, uh, 
I think actually it's setting timers. Ah. <laughs> uh, I am uh, someone who I can get very focused on what I'm doing. Uh, and, uh, the kids know this about me too. So, um, I'll be like, okay, 10 more minutes until bedtime. And they'll be like, okay. And then 30 minutes later, I'll be like, oh, wait, whoops. <laughs> so, um, setting timers to remind myself of things, uh, is, is uh, really great. And it's something the kids have been used to since, since like babyhood where mm-hmm. I'll say like, okay, you get 20 minutes of TV. And I'd set a timer to make sure that I remember in case I Do get it. hyper-focused <laughs> on something. Yes. Uh, and so that that has uh, has made a big difference. And so the kids to this day, if they hear the uh, kitchen timer go off, they'll go, is that our timer? I'm like, no, 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 I'm making something. For, that's right. That, that's dinner. for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny you say timer because I actually have one on my wish list on Amazon that that's it's a traditional timer, kitchen mm-hmm. timer. But when you turn it, it reveals red. So at a glance, mm-hmm. you can mm-hmm. see how much nice. how close or how much time and, yeah. you know. Cause that's, that's my other part. I'll set a timer. And then I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> it, it went off. <laughs> I need more time. So, <laughs> oh, well, Emily, I have really enjoyed this conversation and I know the listeners have as well. So how can they connect with you? Where can they find you? So, um, well, specifically listeners of this mom knows, I'd love to invite you to my website, um, emilyguyberkin.com forward slash TMK for uh, this mom knows listeners. Um, so I'll have a link to um, how to get a hold of that um, uh, uh, ledger that I mentioned. Perfect. And then also uh, a um, free version of just a page of it if you just want to try it out first before you buy. Wonderful. Um, so that's that's one great way. Um, and then you can explore the rest of my site. I've got um, links to my books, my blog, um, my coaching, all of that there. Uh, and then also, if you want to reach me on Twitter, I am on Twitter way more than I should be, mm. <laughs> um, but at Emily Guy Birkin on Twitter. And then also on Facebook, um, it's author Emily Guy Birkin. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.